Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, great to be here. So I'm going to talk about uh, <coughs> cascades and networks and aggregate volatility. Uh, as Ariel said, it's uh, joint with Aso S. Daglar, who is a, uh, a professor in uh, the electrical engineering and computer science, and uh, Ali Reza Tahpa Salehi, who uh, is a postdoc at uh, LIDS, uh, in, uh, and uh, he's now moving to Colombia. So, uh, so let me kind of give a kind of a two-pronged introduction to this. The first, uh, the first uh, uh, broader intro introduction, which I think uh, will be uh, will be hopefully easy for many people around the table here to identify with, is that the the basic thing that we're interested in is how essentially uh, how interactions over a network setting where you have different local interactions with different units. And here I'm going to be much more specific about what units are. Uh, you can think of them as disaggregated sectors or firms. Uh, how those type of interactions transmit shocks over the network. And in particular, what types of networks we can think of as stable, meaning being resilient or robust to certain types of shocks. And, and, in, and, and again, here I'm going to be uh, very specific when we go into a model, but I'm going to be specifically worried about shocks that hit individual units, so no aggregate shocks. So the issue that I'm going to be concerned with is you have a network of different units, and each of them are being hit by different types of shocks. And under what circumstances is it that some of these shocks are going to create, to propagate into the rest of the network through their uh, first affecting their neighbors and then from neighbors to other neighbors and so on and so forth and create an instability over the entire network? Why is this question of interest uh, to networks in general should be pretty straightforward? And I think there's a large literature looking at this problem in various different ways. I think a lot of the work that people have done in the context of, say, for example, stability of uh, the architecture of the internet might be at some level related, or whether a particular type of uh, uh, infection over a social network of interacting individuals actually spreads and infects a lot of people in the, uh, in the population would be related. Uh, something like uh, electricity networks being stable or not stable would be related to this type of issues, and I think uh, computer scientists, uh, as well as uh, Others in the engineering community have thought about these issues. The specific uh, question that's more directly related to the model that we, uh, we write down here is, uh, is, is, is on the origins of economic fluctuations. So uh, one of the major questions, of course, that economists have uh, pondered over the centuries is why is it that the economy is not a stable system and actually have fairly high amplitude fluctuations? So even if you take an economy like the, uh, the US economy or the British economy, which is very developed in terms of its uh, uh, structure. And uh, it has uh, fairly severe recessions, as we have uh, uh, recently experienced. And, uh, and, and even though in the, in the US context, people were kind of uh, talking about the great moderation and how a uh, business cycle has sort of disappeared, you know, the recent events have sort of uh, uh, illustrated that that's not the case. If you look at European economies, for example, which in many ways are as developed as the US one, uh, there have been even more uh, uh, important downturns, for example, if you look at the British economy and so on and so forth. And the traditional answer that, uh, just, just as, a, as, as, as an aside, if you go to a less developed economies or if you go to the US economy in the past, say in the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century, you see even greater amplitude in the, in the fluctuations. So, so in some sense, uh, uh, this is not just a feature of somehow the very recent time. If, if anything, actually, uh, there seems to be more bigger fluctuations. And that's why you know, uh, economists and social scientists uh, uh, ever since the, you know, the 19th century uh, have been worried about this question. So the traditional answers to this uh, essentially look for, we're looking at the aggregate economy, say, for example, why the entire US economy goes into a recession where output falls about 2 3% uh, below where it was the previous year and takes a while to recover and so on and so forth. So since uh, this is an aggregate event, we're looking at the aggregate, uh, aggregate uh, kind of output. So 
for example, GDP per capita or some measure like that, people have looked at aggregate shocks as the first kind of uh, sort of origin of this. So there's a large literature uh, that, that looks at this in the, in the context of economics. You know, people originally had even worried about sunspots that you know, would come and uh, uh, affect the sand rays that hit the, 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 the world. And then people like even like Jevons thought that that could actually have an impact on agricultural productivity. Nowadays in economics, when people talk of sunspots, it's things that actually have no real effect, but still could have an aggregate impact because they, uh, they, they influence aggregate coordination and so on and so forth. But the more popular things are such, such things as aggregate demand or monetary shocks. And that's obviously one candidate, you know, if the uh, uh, Federal Reserve Bank really changes the cost of uh, business for all businesses in the United States, that could have an impact. But we normally don't think that unless, you know, there's some economists in like, uh, 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 you know, Austrian school and so on and so forth, they think that all uh, business cycle fluctuations are caused by, you know, what the Fed does or something like that. You know, most people don't think that, you know, they think the Fed is one of the many factors. In fact, it's in many cases, it might be a mitigating factor, not an amplifying factor, but there's a debate on that. So have people have kind of sort of gravitated towards shocks that are not just monetary in nature, but could be, could be other, otherwise. So, so, so there's a large literature thinking of aggregate productivity shock. But, but actually, it's actually very difficult to think of what these aggregate productivity shocks would be. So one example, which I'll come back to uh, in a second, uh, would be you know, Y2K. So perhaps if the Y2K turned out to be what people feared, that would have created an aggregate shutdown in the economy because uh, the, uh, uh, the computers wouldn't have worked and so on and so forth. You know, of course, it, as it turned out, it was, it was not a problem whatsoever. But you can think of uh, something like Y2K being an aggregate productivity shock. So I'll, I'll come back to that example in a second because I think it's actually not an aggregate productivity shock for reasons that I'll, I'll try to explain and motivate uh, the rest of the talk. So. So when you actually think of these aggregate productivity shock, you know, whether you like Y2K as one or not, you can see that it's actually very difficult to come up with good examples of what, what they might be. So for that reason, people have uh, sort of pondered whether uh, aggregate fluctuations could instead come from much more reasonable disaggregated shocks. You know, I think it's very difficult to say that the entire US economy suddenly, for exogenous reasons, becomes less productive. But it's very easy to think that you know, Harvard could become less productive or more productive because you have a better or worse president, or some of the new things that you're trying to implement uh, just don't work out, or a new company that's trying to uh, change its inventory system suddenly finds out that the specific uh, computer program that they're using is not a good fit for their needs. So that specific company could go up and down. So the question is, you know, if we have individual units in the economy being hit by shocks of this sort, why not get the aggregate fluctuations in the economy as a result of these micro shocks? And for a long time, that has been sort of dismissed. And the reason why it's been dismissed is, is, is of course, very straightforward. Imagine that these, uh, these are firm-specific shocks. You know, depends on which firms you count, but you have in the US economy something like two million firms, okay? If you count those very small firms as well. So if you have anything like a classical central limit theorem, and these shocks really have no correlation with each other, and if they have correlation, that correlation would be the aggregate productivity shock. So that's the, what people were talking about. So take the extreme case where they have no correlation with each other, then the volatility that comes from these things is going to disappear at the rate of square root of n, so square root of 2 million, that's a very, very, very large number. So that disappears very, very quickly. So essentially, there's nothing left. So this sort of traditional uh, central limit theorem type of reasoning has said that uh, let's not worry about firm level shocks. In fact, even disaggregated sectoral shocks, say, for example, things like seven or eight digit in, uh, sectors, which were, you know, you can think of you know, at the level of a specific type of tire, not the tire sector as a whole, but a specific type of tire. Uh, you know, those are going to be, you know, you're going to have about 10,000 or 20,000 of these type of much more disaggregated units. Same kind of reasoning, again, that's going to disappear very quickly. Square root of uh, 20,000 is going to be a very small, a very large number. One over that is going to be a very small number. Now, essentially what this paper is about is about re uh, 
reconsidering this argument. And the reason why this argument and people who have thought about networks will immediately recognize why this argument may at least needs to be reinvestigated a little bit is that the classical central limit theorem essentially assumes that these are unrelated, uncorrelated shocks. OK, I've wanted to take out the aggregate component from that. But the fact that I've taken out the aggregate component doesn't mean that these shocks are independent. And the reason why they're not independent is that these sectors are supplying and purchasing from each other. They have a sort of a local network relationship with each other. You know, some of these uh, disaggregated sectors are my suppliers, and what, what happens to my suppliers is going to be relevant. So the question is whether these type of network effects is going to change this picture of, you know, we don't need to worry about these firm level, uh, firm level shocks or, or uh, disaggregated sectoral shocks, and whether, therefore, these small shocks can create cascade effects over the production network or other networks that you might want to consider and still create sort of instability and what type of uh, structure we need to worry about this instability. And when you actually think about the aggregate shocks that people have in mind, in fact, when you, you'll, you'll quickly discover that many of those examples really have a network effect in them. So why is Y2K actually an aggregate productivity shock? Well, it's not. It's Y2K is something that hits a very specific uh, aspect of the internet architecture. So it shouldn't really have any aggregate shocks if the square root of n argument is right. And square root of n argument says, well, Y2K might make the, that specific aspect of the internet uh, uh, and, 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 and coordination uh, around the year 2000 less productive and more difficult, but other sectors are going to be up at the same time. But the problem is that all the other sectors in the economy were, uh, were depending on the Y2K because of the coordination of their clocks and, and so on and so forth. So the, the danger was, in fact, and that's why we should have actually people thought of it as an aggregate shock, is that that Y2K problem could have created cascade effects and would affect a lot of other sectors that wouldn't be able to do their business for extended periods of time and so on and so forth. So the question is we're trying to, we're going to try to understand uh, how to go, in, go about that. I think in the context of the recent uh, crisis, these questions are even more relevant because I think in many uh, different uh, in, 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 in a several different domains, two of which I'm going to put here, people actually explicitly worried about these network effects. So this is a very common uh, concern that people had. This comes from Charles Plosser, who was the uh, president of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of uh, Philadelphia. Uh, so in the current crisis, we have seen that financial firms that become too interconnected to fail pose serious problem for the financial stability. And, and talks the you know, usual the buzzwords, complexity, interconnectivity, blah, blah, blah. But, but essentially, the counterparty relations were real. And that was why people were very worried about Lehman failing. And, uh, the and, and, and in fact, there were some uh, real after effects. A lot of uh, hedge funds, for example, you, that used Lehman as broker sort of really suffered because uh, they couldn't switch their accounts. Their accounts were frozen. They couldn't trade and so on and so forth. Another one, which is uh, actually uh, it's even better for, uh, for, uh, for the model that's going to come next, is that some of you may remember these uh, eventful uh, trips that uh, the, the, chief, uh, the, 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 the presidents uh, and the chief executive officers of uh, General Motor, Chrysler, and Ford uh, did to Washington. So the first one, they went to ask for bailout for the auto sector. They, they went there in their private jets, and then they got this... Uh, 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 they got this, into this big public relations fiasco because they were asking for uh, for billions of dollars, and they were flying there in their private jets. And then, you know, two months or a month later, they went back uh, driving in their American-made cars from uh, Detroit uh, all the way to D.C. So that's all, of course, great uh, journalism. But something sort of uh, much more interesting may have escaped your attention. There was something quite weird in this, which is that. Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler were all going to DC, but they were asking not for money for all three of them, but they were asking for money for GM and Chrysler. Now, that says something quite strange. You know, uh, these three are the biggest producers and biggest suppliers of cars in the United States. So for Ford, normally, the fact that GM and Chrysler should be in dire problems and should have to cut down on their kind of production would be good news. You know, if my competitors are doing badly, that should be good for me. But in fact, Ford was asking mo for money for GM and Chrysler. So why would that, was that the case? 
And the argument that Ford had is essentially here summarized by Alan Mulally, the, the, the chief executive officer of Ford, is that essentially if one of the domestic comp companies, or one of the domestic competitors fail, we believe that there's a strong chance that the entire industry would face severe disruption. And this is, ours is in a significant way an industry that's uniquely interdependent. And here he was em emphasizing both interdependence on the su uh, supplier side and interdependence on the side of, uh, of, of, their, uh, of their dealers. And, and if one, one of GM and Chrysler fails, uh, there will be no coin effects, and those no coin effects would affect Ford. And in fact, what Ford did is they said, we don't want any money, but we want, a, we want money for GM and Chrysler, and we want an emergency fund in case GM and Chrysler fail, and then our suppliers also fail, and then we might actually be in trouble. So those are the things that we want to kind of start a little, uh, start thinking about a little more systematically. So what we're going to do is we're going to develop a framework for understanding the, how these idiosyncratic unit level shocks may translate into aggregate fluctuations. So the way we're going to do this is look at a production economy with n competitive sectors. So this is going to be similar to a model by Long and Plosser. Uh, and the, the focus on n competitive sectors and the production relationship is just for simplicity. I'll come back and show you that the same mathematics will apply from several different models, although whether this mathematics here captures all of the essences of these different problems is an open question. So I think if you actually want to think of financial linkages, there are a number of reasons why you would want to change the mathematical formalism somewhat from here. So I'm going to model the explicitly the input-output relations here. I mean, I'm going to study the behavior of aggregate volatility defined as the standard deviation of aggregate output for large n. So the, here, I'm making a couple of assumptions, which I'll be much more specific. Uh, you know, I'm going to look at standard deviation. Why? Well, I'll justify why I look at standard deviation. So for most of the talk, I'll focus on standard deviation. I'll come back at the end and show you why standard deviation was a good measure, and then why it's not a good measure. And then I'll show you when it's not a good measure, what happens. And so I'll, I'll, this is not something I'll put under the carpet. And then I'm also going to do it uh, for GDP per capita or aggregate output, which was the uh, justification here. So, so I'm going to try to address which network structures lead to higher aggregate volatilities when all of the shocks come from these idiosyncratic shocks. So this is actually kind of interesting because one might have a lot of different intuitions about this. So for example, you might think something like a ring network. So is that an unstable network or a stable network? Meaning that when, we, when our concern is these idiosyncratic shocks, is something like a ring network going to create a lot of cascades or is that going to create a lot of cascades? So I think at Exante, that's not an easy question to, to answer. So hopefully, we'll see that at the end, it's actually a trivial question to answer once you understand what's, what else is going on. Uh, and then, you know, role of uh, central sectors and so on and so forth. And then I, I'll talk about tail risks in the context of the standard deviation. Okay, so very quick characterization, uh, summary of the results before I jump into the, uh, into the overall thing, uh, into, the, into, the, into the formal model. Uh, so essentially, what I'm going to do is, uh, this is also almost like a plan of the talk. First, I'm going to introduce an economic model. I'm not going to spend much time on the economic model, because what matters is the equilibrium of that model, which is going to have a very nice, neat representation. And then I'll show you, uh, briefly discuss how else you might have re uh, uh, reached that uh, representation. So that's the first part. And then from there, you can also have some explicit characterization of how idiosyncratic shocks feed into aggregate volatility. The problem with that aggregate characterization is that, in general, you need to know the entire matrix and then invert the matrix and so on and so forth. So instead of doing that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to give, to, to give much easier to interpret results relating the questions uh, related, uh, the, the questions that I have posed about the stability of different types of networks and how, how idiosyncratic shocks uh, propagate to aggregate shocks as a function of structural properties of networks, meaning that you don't need to take the entire matrix of the network inverted and then do various different things with it. So you can actually think about the, the properties of the networks in terms of uh, certain easy to think about characteristics and then uh, understand what, uh, what, what that implies about the stability. So in particular, uh, the key things is Going to, I'm going to focus on the conditions under which the rate at which uh, aggregate shocks disappear is slower than square root of n. So that's as a special case is going to have the case in which the law of large number fails. Why? 
because the low large numbers failing is the rate, uh, the case in which the uh, volatility disappears at the rate zero, rather than uh, one over square root of n. Uh, and then uh, to do that, I'm in fact going to kind of emphasize a couple of key things. One is going to be the degrees of the different sectors, uh, which I'm going to show you. And then higher order interconnections, which are going to be second order, third order, fourth order degrees, as I'm going to define. But those are all going to be quite easy structural properties of the input-output matrix. And then I'm going to show you, just with a very simple uh, look at the US supply network, how you can compute these things and what they are in the US economy. So that gives you kind of a sense as whether these issues that I'm talking about here are important for the US supply network. And then I'll talk about let tail risks at the end. Okay, uh, related literature, uh, let me be very quick here. Actually, people have uh, not ignored this question in the economics literature. There, uh, you know, there's a classic paper by Jovanovic in 1987 that looks at a very, very specific example which exactly shows that how you can have uh, idiosyncratic shocks lead to big, large aggregate shocks, essentially it relied on a very specific structure where there are such strong strategic complements that essentially it's almost like multiple equilibria and small shocks are shaking from multiple equilibria. And Derloff is related. Uh, per Bach and the Santa Fe Institute people have been using these kind of sand pile models for thinking about these things. A, they get very complicated and B, I'm not sure what the mapping to economic questions are really in those things. But uh, but the more important, I think there's a very interesting, very nice paper by Gabex uh, about how if the firm size distribution has uh, Pareto tails, this might actually prevent, uh, prevent idiosyncratic shocks disappearing. And the reasoning here is that some firms are very, very large. And then there is also work by Vasco Carvalho, which is very related to what I'm talking about here. It's kind of independent work, but it goes in a different direction than we do here. But several issues that we talk about come up in Carvalho's work as well. Okay, so uh, let me uh, jump right into the model. So this, this part is, uh, is just uh, going to be very standard uh, multi-sector uh, general equilibrium model, but it's useful to kind of get the language right and uh, uh, specify the language and, and, and know what we're talking about, what the assumptions that are going into it. Uh, so we're going to think of an economy consisting of n sectors. As I've already indicated, I'm going to do think of n large. So that what that means is that I'm going to think of an economy that's more and more disaggregated. So you can think of n equals to 10 as being like the one-digit industries. Services, retail, wholesale, uh, non-durable manufacturing, manufacturing. And then we can go to a lower level. We make those this more disaggregated. So you get the two digits, you know, uh, 20, whatever, to, to, and then you can three digit, four digit, five digits. You're making them more and more disaggregated. You're not adding new sectors to the economy, but you're changing the disaggregation level, okay? Uh, each of these sectors has the following production function, okay? Xi is what they produce, and I'm gonna do everything in a static model. There's really no additional insights one gets here in a dynamic model, so I'll do everything in a static model. ZI is a productivity shock. This is the sector level productivity shock. So as I kind of said, if we think of disaggregated enough units, that's, that, that's meaningful. Uh, LI to the power alpha is the labor that they hire. And XIJ is the input that you use from the output of sector J. So in other words, XIJ is how many units of glass do I buy as an auto manufacturer? And that's raised to the power 1 minus alpha and a parameter wij. So essentially, that means that for these sectors that are my neighbors, I use their output as input into my production. Okay. So in particular, what I'm going to make the assumption, this is the first assumption that we're going to make, is that the sum of these wij's is equal to 1. So what that means is that if I increase, if I double xij, which are my intermediates, and my amount of labor, my output doubles. So this is a constant returns to scale economy. That's the kind of the simplest economy to work with. There's going to be zero profits, and, 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 and competitive equilibrium is going to be really nicely behaved. So what is this wij here? So wij is actually exactly what uh, the, the theoretical counterpart, or the empirical, or, or something is, the, is this exact empirical counterpart, is that uh, his exact empir empirical counterpart is if you go to the U.S. Sense, uh, 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 Bureau of Economic Analysis input-output tables, input-output tables essentially give you, they say, for producing one dollar of cars, how many dollars of steel do you need? Okay, so that's what the input-output tables tell you. That's exactly what WIJ is. So in a competitive market, 
WIJ is exactly going to be that number, which is how many dollars of inputs do you use of sector J in producing one dollar of output of sector I? So in fact, this is exactly the f uh, mathematical formulation that would make sense of the input-output tables. Now, the Cobb-Douglas structure here that I have is special, meaning that one, that one could have much more general production functions. But if you have one of these much more general production functions, you have two things. One is that things are not going to be nicely linear, so I won't be able to make as much progress in, in the providing a complete characterization. But second, also, the input-output tables themselves won't make that much sense uh, because the entries of the input-output tables that people use, for example, uh, for a variety of things, would be very strongly a function of prices. The Cobb-Douglas is the only one where those things are not functions of prices, because the, you know, the positive and the negative effects of higher prices on value kind of uh, cancel each other. Okay. So that's what those WIJs are. And I'm going to denote the uh, matrix of the WIJs by WN, N because it's going to be for looked at at different levels of disaggregation. So that's just a regular matrix of WIJs. And of course, since I have assumed that uh, there's other assumption, this is a row stochastic matrix. It's row sums are equal to 1. Okay? So that doesn't need to be the case. You could allow different row sums here. That doesn't really matter so much. You can adjust alpha and allow for different row sums, but that's, not, that's just a uh, uh, relatively easy, uh, relatively innocuous simplification. Zi is the productivity shock, and it's multiplicative. That's normal. You know, if you do, if you had an additive one in a structure like this, you you might end up with negative output and so on and so forth. So multiplicative is much more natural. So I'm going to work with its uh, log. So epsilon i is the log of Zi, and I'm going to denote the distribution of uh, epsilon i by Fi. So an economy, therefore, uh, is characterized by a set of sectors, a level of disaggregation and supply input-output matrix and distributions for the productivity shocks hitting all of the sectors. Okay? And I'm going to look at more and more disaggregated uh, 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 economies as I go along. So as I said, I'm, gonna, I'm making two assumptions here in addition to the assumptions that are already built in in, in looking at the Cobb-Douglas and competitive markets, which I, I'll highlight in a second. But one of them is this thing here that uh, they, it's a row stochastic. I've already mentioned that. The second is that I'm normalizing the mean of epsilon to zero. That's without any. Uh, that's without any substantive thing. You could put any constant here you want. That doesn't affect anything. So that essentially means that the mean of zi here is equal to one. Uh, that's not without any. That, that that is just a normalization. The more slightly more important one is that I'm assuming that the variance of epsilon i is bounded between uniformly bounded below and above. So what that means is that, of course, if I look, was looking at, a sec, at, 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 at an economy with n sectors and just did that analysis, this, is, this assumption is just true by definition. But what's important is that when I take the sequence of economies, the variance doesn't go to 0 or infinity, which I think is fairly uh, innocuous as well. But it's important. Otherwise, we wouldn't have this characterization. Okay. All right. So uh, let me just repeat what I've just said and start building up towards the competitive equilibrium. So this is the output of sector i. Wij is what sector j's input, how much sector j's input is necessary for sector i. Okay? So that's, that's what this is. So Wij is from j to i. Okay? So I'm going to define a degree of sector j as the share of sector J's output in the input, uh, input supply of the economy. So that, in other words, is the degree of sector J is the sum of Wij. So in other words, if you think of this matrix Wn, it's a row stochastic matrix. Row sums are equal to 1. Column sums are not equal to 1. So degrees are the column sums. Okay. All right. So what does a firm do? A firm in sector I solves a very straightforward maximization problem, Pi xi. That's the price that I have times output minus the wage that I pay for labor. I'm going to denote the wage by H since I use W for my ma matrix. So I take the wage as given. And I take the prices of all of the inputs as given. So that's PJ, XIJ. And I decide how much of these inputs to buy. And I do this subject to the production function as the constraint. So I'm taking the market wage and the price of all of the products, including my product and all of the inputs as given. OK? So. What about consumers? Consumers are very straightforward. They just have some utility function. They value of all, the, all of the goods. And I put them symmetric here. That doesn't really matter. If that wasn't symmetric, that would be treated just like another sector. 
and a representative consumer just maximizes utility subject to the expenditure being less than or equal to or equal to, to his income. What's the income in this economy? Well, if you look at the production problem, there's no capital here. All of these things are intermediate goods. So they're part of gross sales, but they're not part of value added. So the only thing that produces income here is labor. So income is equal to labor. So the, uh, the, uh, so, 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 so all, all the all overall income is wage income, which is H here. <coughs> you could put capital here. That doesn't really make any difference. Okay. So, all right. So the final thing is I have to define a competitive equilibrium, but that's all, I'm almost done that. The representative consumer maximizes her utility. I wrote that already. The representative firms in each sector maximize their profits. I wrote that problem already. And labor and commodity markets clear. So I just need to impose that. What goes to consumption plus what goes to intermediates has to be equal to the total production of that sector. So if I'm the steel sector, what goes into consumption from steel? Actually, nothing probably goes into direct consumption from steel. But whatever goes into direct consumption from steel plus everything I supply to all of the other economies as intermediate goods have to exhaust my total output. And total labor is equal to labor supply, which is 1. OK, any questions? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. So is this is it being interpreted as saying that uh, small sectors have the same um, kind of level of cost as large uh, sectors? Mm -hmm. that yeah. So that's a very good point. So you might actually think that as I make the economy more and more disaggregated, somehow the, the variance of the, of the shocks should also go down. But actually, it's, it's not so clear exactly how that should go. So imagine that uh, you are one sector right now, and I'm c calling you the tire sector. And then I'm disaggregating you into tires of this type of rubber for trucks versus so on and so forth. If there was, if I, what I, st I start with is the microstructure, each micro unit is hit by a shock. When I aggregate that up to you, your variance would actually be lower if these things were independent. So in some sense, when I go to lower units, I shouldn't kind of have a decline. And now the correlation structure is important, but, but it's, it's not true that when I go to lower and lower units, because the units are lower, the, the, sh the shocks should disappear. And that part of that is because everything is multiplicative. Now, if things weren't multiplicative, you would absolutely be right. But oh, sorry. Uh, but if you look at this, this is, this is multiplicative. So it's a percentage shock to my sales. So for that reason, I think it's a, it's a natural assumption. But, but of course, one could imagine different, different scenarios. OK. So let me define aggregate output or value added in the economy. So I, I already told you what that is. That's H. That's the labor income. So I'm defining log of H. Everything's log is nicer here. So I'm going to call log of H YN. YN because this is for an economy of uh, disaggregations of size N. And then the equilibrium has a very simple structure, which has this, this is the following. In equilibrium, Yn is a convex combination of the epsilon shocks of the different sectors. So it's the sum r over from i to n, Vn of i. Of course, Vn of i, because this, the, the level of disaggregation is going to matter for the exact convex combination. Or writing in matrix notation or vector notation, it's the, uh, v, the, the inner product of V and the epsilon vectors. And what is this Vn? So this is what we're going to call the influence vector. And you'll, of course, recognize it. Uh, and I'll talk more about it in, in the next slide. But it's essentially defined as the product of a matrix of ones and the inverse of this thing here, which is the identity matrix minus uh, 1 minus alpha times the, uh, the supply matrix. So this form, of course, will be very familiar to both economists and uh, computer scientists for different reasons. For economists, this is related to the Leontief inverse. Uh, for computer scientists, it's related to the page rank uh, algorithm, or among other things. But so let me skip perhaps this slide, which is uh, will be insulting your knowledge of writing this in different ways uh, as a as a sum of the matrices or whatever. Just uh, remind you that this is uh, it's several different things. It's exactly the page rank vector in the internet search algorithms. Uh, you can see that here, for example. So the V, v matrix is your importance and importance relative to where you are in the network. So that's the kind of the, kind of the Google PageRank interpretation. It's also the Bonacic centrality measure in network 
uh, stuff. And also from an economics point of view, it's the vector of gross sales. Remember, sales and value added are not the same here. I might have a very high lar large sales, but not very much value added. Why? Because I use a lot of intermediates. So if I look at the vector of sales, that would be also the VN vector. Okay. Any questions here? So this is the crucial slide for understanding what the mapping from the later mathematical results to economic or, or other characteristics of the networks are going to be. Any questions here? OK. All right. So just one in passing relationship. In fact, I could have skipped the last 15 minutes. And I could have just given you a reduced form model and said, I'm going to consider an economy where some measure of interest, y tilde vector, is 1 minus alpha some matrix times y tilde plus some shocks. And that would have given exactly the same. This would be a reduced form of this. So essentially what I did is I derived this from the most canonical uh, general equilibrium model of multi-sector economy. Uh, but you can imagine situations in which you might start with something like this. So for example, instead of a production economy, if you had a financial economy, you might start with something like this. You might have some other model that has similar linear or log linear structure in, in the context of networks that are hit by these kind of idiosyncratic shocks, you might start with something like this. You might have a game that can be like a linear quadratic game that can be approximate that, that will have a linear solution that and you want to use uh, take the strategic complementarities and substitutabilities of that game as given and do this kind of analysis and then you'll also have a reduced form model like this and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, once we are here, then the rest is going to be uh, sort of uh, not easy, but, but, but sort of expected where we're going to go. So the first thing is, we know what this yn is. And I'm going to look at first the st standard deviation. So sigma aggregate is the standard deviation of yn, or the square root of the variance. So that's obviously the square root of the variance of the each sector multiplied by the square of the uh, weights that they're getting in that convex combination. So again, remember, this is the equation here. So just take the variances of these things, and that's going to give us this here. So here I'm using the fact that all of the epsilons are independent. Any correlation they had, that was taken out as aggregate shock. Of course, you could put some correlation in there that won't change this picture all that much. So now we have an exact expression for this thing. So if you give me a matrix, I can use this equation here to calculate the Vn vector. And from there, I can calculate what the, what the standard deviation is. So that's not, you know, that can be done, but that's not very insightful, because it doesn't tell you what structural properties of that supply matrix are important. So that's the next thing I'm going to do. Yes, David? Mm -hmm. So, h is a stochastic variable. So h is a function of the realization of all of these epsilons. And in fact, you can see it here. h and yn are the same thing. So yn, is yn is a random variable. So e each of these is a random variable. Right. So it's a random variable that's some uh, is a convex combination of n other random variables. So we're going to care about the we're gonna change all of the distribution, the, the entire distribution, but for reasons that. This mean is going to be 0. Why? Because all of these epsilon i's have mean 0. So I've skipped that part. And so next, I'm going to uh, focus on the uh, standard deviation. Why? First of all, that's what a lot of people in the macro focus on. Second, if I show you that the standard deviation goes to 0 from Markov, whatever, Chebyshev, of course, the distribution concentrates around 1. But second, I'm also going to give you limit theorems of the central limit theorem sort that superficially will tell you, oh, you should just care about variance. And then I'll tell you why that's actually not true. But that, whether I actually get there or not, that's, a, that's an issue. Uh, show the consumer model again. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Oh, OK. So there is a utility question. Mm -hmm. So the consumers have preference in it, and you're not going to care about the structural bias? Well, that's already all in factored in. Oh, you have it up there. Sorry. I so that's here. And that's already, already taken into account yeah. in this equilibrium. The one thing I didn't tell you is that there's this ANs here, which I am taking those ANs to, inf uh, to something as n I take n to infinity, but that doesn't affect, uh, that, that only affects the mean of yn. It doesn't affect the variance, so that's why I didn't tell you about that. Okay. All right. So one immediate implication here is that uh, 
if I don't want to compute, but I just want to tell you a limiting result, it's obviously that uh, the standard deviation of aggregate volatility, uh, of aggregate output or aggregate volatility, scales with the two norm, the Euclidean vector norm of the v, matrix, v vector. Okay. So that you can already see from here. So we know that exactly again, but again, of course, we don't know what this matrix, what, what this norm is. So to do that, I'm going to do, now I'm going to go in two steps. First, I'm going to look at the question, the simple, this is a warm up, and again, given that this audience probably knows all of, you know, uh, uh, this is, many of you might be familiar with, uh, with, 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 with issues like this, uh, so perhaps the warm up is not really all that necessary, but let me do it in any case. So first I'm going to do the warm up of when does the law of large numbers not apply. And then I'm going to say, I'm going to give you a much more general theorem where, which gives you the characterization even when the law of large number applies. So to do that, let me just give me, give, uh, give me two seconds to give two definitions. One of them I'm going to call that, I'm going to say that a sequence of economies has a dominant sector if the infinity norm is of order one. What that means is that essentially we're making the model, the, the, the economy more and more disaggregated. So if I make it as more and more disaggregated, if a sector still supplies a non-vanishing fraction of other sectors, that's a dominant sector. So what is the infinite norm? That's the largest element of that vector. So essentially, uh, for that to be order of one, which means that the largest element is not going to zero. You would normally expect it to go to zero. We're making it more and more disaggregated. But if it doesn't go to zero, then there is a dominant sector. Okay. So let me give you another definition. A sequence of economies has a star-like structure if the degree of one sector, some sector i, is of order n. So in other words, if I look at the degree of a particular sector, it grows exactly at the same rate as n. Okay? So now, obviously, a star-like structure implies dominant sector, because if your degree is growing at the rate n, you can easily see from the definition of the V matrix that your entry is not going to go to zero. But the other way around is not true. So dominant sector is much more general than a star-like structure. So here is an example. This is a star-like structure. It's not a star, but it's like a star because this sectors, uh, all, all of these are equal. Equal. You know, this is a weighted graph. But here, whenever I do a so one thing, I should make it clear. Just as a convention, everything in the paper and everything in the talk when I do mathematics is weights. Everything is weighted, obviously. But whenever I do graphs, I don't want to put weights, so everything is equal weighted in the graphs. Okay. So here. Uh, this guy has equal weights to n over two sectors, so its degree grows, uh, it's, it's a star-like structure. On the other hand, it's not an exact star. Look at this one here. This one here has log n neighbors, so it's not a star-like structure. Its degree doesn't grow at the rate n, but it's still a dominant sector. Why? Because what you should do is not just care about your degree, but you should care about the degree of your neighbors and so on and so forth. And that's the cascade that we're, that's going to come in. And that's the why this is important for building intuition. So we're going to see that exactly the same thing is going to come over and over again. What's going to matter is not your degree and how your degree is distributed, but is the, the, is the is, is, is you know who you influence, and then you know the degrees of those people and so on and so forth. So. So that now the, uh, the result is a trivial one here, is that if, the, if and only if the sequence of economies does not have dominant sectors, which means that as n goes to infinity, all sectors' weights goes to zero, the law of large numbers holds. Otherwise, the law of large numbers doesn't hold. So that's also very natural. Think of a star. If you had literally a star, obviously it wouldn't hold. Why? Because there's just going to be one sector that the influence of that sector is never going to disappear. The shocks that hit that sector always are going to have propagate to the rest of the economy. So essentially, you need, you need to rule out not only stars, but things that are like stars or things that are weaker like these dominant sectors. OK, so now let me jump into the most interesting part of the results, which is not really that law of large numbers doesn't hold. I think that's a very extreme case. It's not really, it's really kind of unreasonable to expect that when we go disaggregated, any sector is going to be so important that shocks that hit it will immediately go to the rest. But really, if we have something like a law of large numbers, but it's going to kick in much slower than the square root of n. So to do that, let me give you one more definition which is coefficient of variation. Of course, everybody knows this definition, but let me give it in any case. So the coefficient of variation is the standard deviation of the degrees divided by average degree, okay? so divided by n. 
uh, average degrees fixed by the row stochasticity of the matrix. Yes, please? Oh, sorry. Everything here I'm talking about, I'm so sorry, yeah, absolutely. So everything I've, I'm talking about are out degrees for the very simple reason, where, where is that? Uh, for the very simple reason that this is how I've defined it, sum of Wij, and the in degrees are not interesting because this W matrix is row stochastic. So there's nothing interesting going on with the in degrees. So I, whenever I talk of degrees, it's out degrees, but I don't say it because that's one word to say. Sorry. I should have. I should have clarified that. Okay, so this is a coefficient of de deviation, a coefficient of variation of out degrees. So here is the first result. Uh, for any sequence of economies, aggregate volatility is lower bounded, so it's omega, one over the coefficient of variation divided by square root of n. Okay, so let me try, I'm gonna try to give intuition for this. So this is a lower bound, and it's not a tight lower bound. Uh, I'm going to make it tighter and tighter, and then I'll give you a the, the, the tightest result later on. Uh, but, but, but I think lower bounds here give most of the intuition that you want. Why? Because if you lower bound something and you say it's not going to, s to zero, it's going to zero at the rate slower than, say, log n, you already know what's going on. Okay? So in particular, if the lower bound is uh, slower than 1 over square root of n, you know that it's much slower than the standard results and the traditional answers. So here is one over coefficient of variation of this. So let's try to get an intuition. Let's try to look at three examples. This is the empty graph. Obviously, the coefficient of variation is equal to zero. That's pretty straightforward. This is the complete network. That's a coefficient of variation of zero as well. Why? In the complete network, everybody has the same outlinks as, uh, as, as everybody else, out degree as everybody else. So there is no coefficient of variation. So you can see what happens when the coefficient of variation is zero. Lower bound is one over square root of n. I'm not telling you in this theorem, but in fact that's the upper bound as well. So it's really one over square root of n here. What happens if I have a star? Now you can see the previous theorem as a special case of this theorem. When you have the star, you can easily compute that the coefficient of variation scales at square root of n. So this is one over square root of n over square root of n, so it's order one. So it doesn't go to zero at all. So this is one way of giving the intuition. Let me try to give you an intuition of this in a different way by giving a corollary to this. To do that, and since I'm running out of time, let me not define it. Everybody knows what it is. So here I give a, a formal definition of what I mean by a power tail structure. So essentially, power tail structure, I mean that the degree distribution has a Pareto tail or power law tail with a shape parameter beta. And I define that not exact. People often define this as exact, which doesn't make sense, especially if you look at data. So I define this just in terms of slowly varying functions, just the usual thing. And the beta is the scaling parameter or the shape parameter. So here is a corollary. If a sequence of economies has a power law tail structure with scaling index beta, then the lower bound is n to the power minus beta minus 1 over beta. Okay? So in other words, if beta was equal to 2 exactly, this would be square root of n. But if beta is, instead of 2, is like uh, a half, for example, this would be 1 over 4, much slower than square root of n. Okay? So smaller beta means bigger aggregate fluctuations out of small shocks. Okay? All right. But this is very non-tight. To make it tighter, I need to look at the more interesting thing of not the degree, but the actual higher order interconnections. So to do that, I will also, and by doing that, I will also get closer to the notion of cascades here. Because what are cascades? Cascades is not that I fail and my neighbors fail. Cascade is I fail, my neighbors fail, and the failure of my neighbors can, is transmitted to somebody else. So I fail, that makes John fail, and John then makes it Scott fail, and so on and so forth. I'm sorry, Scott. Okay. Uh, so, but we're not capturing that with the degree information. There is nothing in the degree information about that. This is just only my one links. Okay? So here is an example. Two structures here. They have identical degree distributions. But obviously you can see immediately that they're going to have very different propagation of shocks. Here you have D identical structures. So for D large, they're going to be behave like independent events. So here, these D structures are linked by having a common supplier, one. So if when, whatever shocks hit this guy is going to have very different implications. So even though they have the same degree structure, they have very different second order degree structure. 
So they have the same children, but children of children have very different stochastic distribution. So to do that, we define the following second order interconnectivity coefficients. So, so those of you who may have looked at uh, preferential attachment models, and you can sometimes people define an S metric for, for these things. So this is the, the related to the S metric, but it's different than the S metric. S metric captures whether high degree nodes are connected to each other. What this captures, if you just parse out the mathematics here, is that whether high degree nodes have common parents. Okay? So it's that, and you can see that you can just you can think of this as the rearrangement inequality. When do you get a high interconnectivity coefficient? When you rearrange things so that you link uh, high degree nodes together with common parents. Okay, so here is an example. This is an example with low tau 2, and this is an example with high tau 2. Again, entirely the same degree distribution, but here what you have is that there's a one parent and has two children, and these two children, one of them has high degree, the other one has low degree. Same thing here. And see here, I have done the rearrangement, that's exactly the intuition of the rearrangement inequality. I've made this guy have two children with high degree, this guy with two children with low degree. Now you can see here, if these, uh, these shocks hit uh, these two guys with, uh, say, negatively correlated shock, this is going to be a very stable structure, but here, sometimes this guy goes down, and when this guy goes down, all of these many, many high degrees go down. So it's going to be not very, very stable. So here is the result, uh, a tighter lower bound. The, uh, the aggregate volatility scales with 1 over square root of n, coefficient of variation over square root of n, and the square root of the tau 2 divided by n. So in other words, not only the coefficient of variation, which are the first order degrees, but also the second order degrees matter. And let me just skip this example because I'm running out of time, but essentially it kind of uh, brings the same point just like I did with the coefficient of variation, shows how you can get this thing square, scale with n square, so therefore this actually doesn't go to zero. So you can get the second order degree, prevent the law of large numbers applying. So, but let me give you a different interpretation for it, which is again from the Pareto tail. Imagine that now I define qi, which is exactly the second order degree. What was degree? Degree was the row, uh, so column sums, so some of the weights that I have in other people's production function. So second order degree is I sum that, I sum those WJIs using the degree. So essentially I'm counting the degrees of my, not of my children, so I'm, I'm counting the degrees of my children. Rather than my degree, I'm counting the degrees of my children. That's why it's second order degree. So imagine that the second order degree has a power, low tail, power tail with parameter shape parameter zeta, then we have the same thing. The, this uh, aggregate volatility scales with minus zeta minus 1 over zeta. And in particular, if both the first order and the second order degrees have power low tails, it's really the minimum of beta and zeta that dominates the, uh, how uh, idiosyncratic shocks lead to uh, aggregate shocks. Okay. Now you can now extend that, you can define m mth order interconnectivity coefficient, and then you can do the kind of a Taylor expansion-like thing, which you have, you have all of the additional terms here. Okay, you can go as, as far back as you want. Okay, now let me also give you the converse of the result, which is what are upper bounds, or exact rates of, and, and this kind of uh, answers the question that I started with. Is the ring, for example, a stable structure? And so I say that a sequence of economies is balanced if the maximum degree is uniformly bounded above. So one example would be something is balanced if all sectors have the same out degree, or they have out degrees that are similar. And for any sequence of balanced economies, the aggregate volatility scales with 1 over square root of n. So therefore, intuitively, one might have expected, perhaps you're uh, wiser than that, you might not have expected it, but I might have expected it, I'm more naive, uh, that something like a ring would be a very unstable structure. But actually, the ring is extremely stable for the sort of variations that we're considering here. What is unstable are things like trees. Why? Because we're not looking at failure, so this is a linear model, and we're looking at things that hit symmetrically all of the sectors. So when you have, uh, when you have rings, all of these guys are similar, so none of them have a special position. So that's why things still nicely aggregate and you don't create cascades. Whereas when you have things like this, this guy is not like the other guys. That's why you create cascades. Okay? So now let me just give you a very quick uh, empirical illustration. Let me now go back to the data 
And let's look at that input output matrix that I mentioned. So from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, you have the commodity by commodity direct requirements table, which is essentially the equivalent of the WIJ matrix here. You have it for 423 sectors, not very disaggregated, but you know, it gives at least some equivalent of it. So it has things like semiconductor, retail, device manufacturer, wholesale trade. So it has very broad things like wholesale trade. You would mind much more disaggregated, but you know, that's that's what it is. So and then look at the degrees and look at the first order degrees, second order degrees. So these are the plots of the first order degrees and the second order degrees. Obviously, these are not Pareto distribution, but look at the tail. This is the log log plot. This is the counter cumulative CDF, the usual thing. So these tails are fairly linear. And here I just show it graphically, but in the paper we do this by nonlinear uh, <coughs> nonlinear estimation. And when you do the nonlinear estimation, you indeed get that that uh, that the tails uh, are are linear according to the estimation procedure. And what are the coefficients? Beta 1.5 and zeta 1.3. So actually remember the result here. The result is that whichever is the minimum, that's the one that matters. So what that implies is that actually for the US economy, with the input output structure, what's going to be much more important is not the degree distribution, but the second order degree distribution. So that's 1.3. And 1.3, by the way, is a very, very unstable structure, turns out. Why? Well, you can think of it this way. Uh, essentially, what you're going to have is that instead of square root of n, you're going to have, what is it, 1.3, uh, 1.3 minus 1, 3.3 divided by 1.3. So that's about, uh, that's about 1.5. So it's going to be n to the power 1 minus 1. Point, sorry, m minus 1 over 5. So it's going to be much, much slower. So just to give you an example, if you just take the economy, so at the same level of disaggregation, but add the service sectors, that's about 2,300 sectors. Each of these have about 0.2 uh, variance by themselves. So if you had square root n type of result, you would have an aggregate vo volatility that's essentially trivial, 0 0.005. But if you do the lower bound from the second degree distribution, you get 0 0.004, which is you know, an order of magnitude larger. So actually, the US economy seems to have this kind of higher interconnectivity structure where exactly like the Ford and GM were worried about, sectoral, sectoral shocks can really propagate throughout the rest of the economy. So let me now uh, say a couple of things a little bit more technical, which is why did I focus on, uh, why did I focus on variance? So the first thing is that you can also show that. Yes. Yes, John? Uh, we didn't, know, but we could have. Yeah, we should have done that. Okay. Uh, yeah, that would, have been a, that would have been a good thing to do. We, we, we thought that the second order degree was, uh, was, 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 was sort of enough to give most of the intuition. And I'm not taking this very seriously. At some level, this is a kind of like an illustrative thing. The reason why I'm not taking it seriously is the following. I mean, this is a problem with, you know, when people here might, 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 might think of this as less of a problem than I do. But I mean, in, in computer science, uh, in physics, and now increasingly in economics, people are looking at these Pareto tails a lot. And I think it's a very nice way of s summarizing the data. But I'm, I'm not, you know, essentially what you're doing here is the, the exercise is to say, well, here in a, in a given sample of a given size, I'm, all, I'm seeing this tail. So I am extrapolating very much out of sample that as n gets larger and larger, the additional draws are going to come from here. And that, I think, is I don't really have much confidence in that. So I think a given the distribution having a linear tail doesn't really tell me all that much. So that's why I didn't really push that too much. But anyway, so, so uh, technically, uh, essentially what we have here, and I'm not going to spend because, uh, uh, yes, Ariel, I want to. I think that's a very good question. I think, I think there are two issues here. One is that, actually, let me come back to that, because I think that's what I'm going to try to address in the last slide. Uh, I think it's an excellent question. It's a very important question. But let me, let me come back to it, because I'm going to talk of it uh, uh, in, in, in the context of a bunch of other issues. So, so, so let me do the boring things first. I'll give you a couple more technical results. So the first technical result, which I'm going to skip, is essentially that under fairly weak conditions, you can show that uh, 
for arbitrary distribution of shocks, if this condition is halt, and then we have more primitive condition for this, this condition, this is not a very strong condition. This is that the infinity norm divided by the two norm goes to zero, and that tends to be very, very easy. Okay? When that holds, then this aggregate output scaled by one over the Euclidean norm, the two norm, actually does go to a normal. So in fact, this, is, this, would be, this was our justification. This is what we started with. In fact, the, the first result that we proved was this because we, want, we were worried about why look at the standard deviation. And then we, we proved this result and we said, okay, standard deviation, and then we, we wrote the entire paper with standard deviation. And that's not so surprising. Once you have this result, the scaling factor is exactly the square root of n, and then the, that's, the, that, that, that's the scaling factor for, the, uh, for, for square root of n. That's very, that's very easy. Now, however, it turns out, and this, this I'm sure some people here know this, but, but the fact that the distribution goes to normal doesn't tell you that, in fact, standard deviation is a sufficient statistic. Be why? Because this is a central limit theorem, so it's about really about centrality, which is, it's about the fluctuations that are small. So if you think of the moment generating function, you're looking at the approximating the moment generating function with the low moments. Okay? So it's not really telling you that if you want to worry about large shocks, say for example tail events, what matters is the standard deviation. And so the next I'm going to show you that, and I'm going to give you one theorem about tail events. So to show you that, here is, the, here, is the, here is an example. Here's a very simple economy. There's one sector that supplies log n sectors, and then the remaining sectors are independent. And you can immediately verify that the two norm here is 1 over square root of n. And the conditions of that previous theorem, which I skipped over, are satisfied so that this, this thing actually goes to normal. So this is as well behaved as you might want. It goes to, to, to normal at the square root of n, and it goes to normal. So it's the standard central limit theorem. However, <coughs> let's look at a tail event, which is probability that yn ends up to be less than minus c, where c is some positive constant. And consider two cases where, in fact, shocks are normal versus shocks are a little different from normal. So I'm not going to take anything like crazy like Pareto tails or even log normal, just exponential tails. And here is the difference. In one case, this thing scales with n. In this other case, it scales with n over log n. So what that implies is that there is a huge difference between the likelihood of tail events. So in this case, tail events would be something like one in a billion. In this case, they will be like something like a 10% recession. Here it would be one in a billion. Here it would be uh, one in a 10,000. So one in a 10,000 is still a small number, but relative to one in a billion, that's a very, very, very large number. So the, despite the fact that this is extremely well behaved, central limit theorem and so on and so forth, tail events are very different. And the reason for that is, you know, the central limit theorem is telling you about the behavior for regular shocks, not really very, very large shocks. So what can we say for the very, very large shocks? So this is the proposition. In fact, <coughs> if you have normal distributions, so shocks have very thin tails, then in fact the tail events also scale with the two norm. However, if you have symmetric distribution with exponential tails, a little thicker than normal, then they scale with 1 over the infinite norm of the v. So in this case, you know, where the distribution is still going to normal in the limit, but it's going a little bit more slowly, and that implies very, very di different behavior for tail events. So in this case, tail events are orders of magnitudes more likely than the other case. So that, I think, has very important, important distinctions or very important implications. So when you see big shocks in this economy, they not necessarily come from big shocks that hit sectors or very la large tails of the shocks of the sectors, but it may actually come precisely because the network structure is, again, creating cascade effects, and now the cascade effects are, are, are not for the kind of central events, but for the big events. Okay. So let me now talk about uh, wrapping it up. And, and answering uh, Ariel's question. So I think uh, there, th what we have done is we have constructed a, 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 a micro-founded, very simple, multi-sector economy and characterized the equilibrium exactly and characterized the behavior of, of volatility and how idiosyncratic shocks uh, build up in that case. Now, 
There are a couple of things that are special about this economy, and I want to emphasize them, and, and this, this will also bring me to, to Ariel's question. So the first thing that's really special about this is the linearity. So, so some of the results are actually, I think, quite surprising. So something like the ring network being very stable is very surprising. So if you look at the financial network literature, people give the ring network as the prima facie case why financial networks are going to be unstable. So, so why is it that we're, we're ending up with something diametrically opposed to that? Well, there are two reasons. First of all, because people who make those claims haven't really backed it up with any kind of mathematical analysis. That's the first reason number one. But, but reason number two, actually, that they, they have a point which is not in this model. And that is the linearity here. Linearity essentially forces you to look at things in a very symmetric way. And symmetric things do very well under linearity. But what people might be worried uh, by in financial networks, for example, may be something very nonlinear. Like, for instance, if you have debt contracts, most of the time I don't mind that my counterparty, John, is not doing so well. Because he's not doing so well, but he's still paying me back. He's doing very well, he's paying me back. But if he actually goes under, then I care about it. But that's, not a, that's a very nonlinear structure. So the first thing you want to go away from is the linear structure. So you want to kind of ad adapt this analysis for a nonlinear structure, which turns out to be doable, but much harder. So that's work in progress. The second thing is I really had to think here in terms of, I, I, originally I did have this slippage, right? I talked about firms and then disaggregated sectors. Firms, disaggregated sectors. Here I really have to talk about disaggregated sectors. Why? Because my W matrix is not a choice variable. It's given to you by technology. So ideally what I would like to do is think of this W matrix as a choice. So it's the relationship between Ford and its suppliers. And in fact, empirically you can do that because the census data, it turns out, has very good information about your suppliers. So, so some people at Chicago have now just gotten the permission to use the census data to do that. So there is an empirical counterpart, not only at the sectoral level, but even much more disaggregated at the firm level. But then when you do that, you really have to deal with Ariel's question, which is that how is it that this structure has come about? Because actually in the US economy, there are about 1,000 auto parts suppliers. But Ford works with 30 of them, and GM works with another 30 of them. Why is it that they work with these 30, and why is it that there's actually this overlap that they work with the same 20? So I think there are, there are many interesting issues here. And one of them is essentially working with, a, uh, with, with another firm requires relationship-specific investments. So you need to make these relationship-specific investments and build these relationships. And building many of them is costly. So what essentially Ford seems to do is that they don't want to put all of their eggs in one basket. So they do multiple sourcing. They want to have multiple suppliers that can give similar things to them. But they don't want too many of them because coordinating them would be very difficult. So there's this trade-off between paying the coordination cost with many, many, many people versus putting your egg in a few baskets. And if you're going to put your eggs in a few baskets, which firms do you want to pick? The ones that are the highest quality. So just because John is using the highest quality and John is my competitor, I don't want to say, no, no, I'm not going to use the highest quality guy. So there is a natural reason why we're both going to kind of want to work with Scott, because Scott is the highest quality supplier there. Okay? So, uh, so, so you have to... You have to kind of endogenize the network structure here, and there are lots of interesting economic issues that come up. And one interesting issue is exactly this one, which is what would a social planner or a designer do if differently from the firm? So in this model, again, that question is not so interesting because this is a competitive equ equilibrium. It's Pareto optimum. Now, you can say Pareto optimality is not the criterion that I want to care about. I, wanna, I might want to minimize variance. So not all Pareto optima have the same variance. I might want to pick among the Pareto optima the one that's, that's minimum. But if you go to this endogenizing network structure, you lose actually Pareto optimality. Then the designer actually starts doing much more interesting things. So that's another very interesting firm uh, direction. And then you can think about what, what the designer wanting to ma maximize some measure of ex ante welfare or minimizing uh, variance. So one of the issues that actually the designer may want to increase the resilience of the system. Because one of the externalities that may arise in things like this is that people may not care about precisely these kind of tail events type things. So that's another issue that people, uh, you might want to kind of uh, worry about here. And then there are obviously uh, the empirical investigation I did here was very, very illustrative. So you might want to delve deeper in a variety of directions. So uh, Ariel told me to stop. Uh,
10 minutes to, so, I, so 12 minutes to, so I can now take some questions. Yes, please. Um, with the Zingnet network, um, is the percentage also a difference in the time it takes to reach a collision uh, after the, the shock? I mean, when I, when I think about the difference between the Zingnet network and the speed graph, I think, well, they both have the, you know, go down and walk on the graph, but the stationary distribution is a lot longer than this. That's a good question. So, those kind of issues don't arise here because. Uh, but 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 it could in, in, in more general in, in, in extended versions. So essentially here what I'm doing is that I'm looking at a competitive equilibrium that's reached immediately. So there are two ways in which you can put dynamics here. One of them is you can do this over time with sticky behavior. So I start producing, I get hit by shocks, but I can't adjust immediately. Then you're going to have a stochastic process over this graph, and that might actually behave that way. And then you're going to worry about the convergence time and things like the largest eigenvalue, which, has, which plays no role here, might actually come in. The other thing that it might actually be that equilibrium doesn't come up, come itself. It comes out as a Tatonman process. And actually, this model would be one, I think, where Tatonman would work reasonably well, because there are everything are complements here. So not because of the usual substitution theorems, but the converse of them. So that you could do Tatonman. And again, I would imagine something like the uh, mixing times of the Markov chains of the networks would come in. But I haven't really investigated these issues. Yes, please. So let's say you're the king of the US economy. Do you think that I resign. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Before you do. Uh, do you think, pardon, uh, as a result of work like this, someday it'll be the case that the uh, antitrust division of the government, et cetera, not only reviews mergers, but also supply chain deals to ensure that the economy does have enough safety, uh, sort of disallowing that level of efficiency? That's a very interesting question. I mean, I think. There is actually a good reason for, in my opinion, and totally stepping out of here, there is actually a good reason to, out of this particular framework. There's a good reason why you might want to look at supply chains, even if you weren't worried about uh, volatility. And that's because me and, uh, if John and I are two of the major seven firms in the auto industry and we share suppliers, that will create an implicit tendency for implicit price collusion. Because we're actually coordinated on the same suppliers. And so I think there are actually good reasons for why you may want to think about the supply chain, even if you were doing just bo boring, plain vanilla uh, 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 antitrust. Now, the other point that you're raising, I think, is a valid one, that I think somebody should look at the uh, uh, input-output structure of the economy, but it, would, it wouldn't be a trust issue. So it would be some other division of the government that should do it. But obviously, I think the recent Certainly in the financial network, it's, a, it's, an anti, it's maybe an antitrust issue. And, and I think the financial industry does, uh, has sort of woken up to that. If you go to the, to the feds, a lot of people are now trying to make sense of financial network uh, linkages in various different markets and so on and so forth. So I think people are thinking about that kind of issue. So you might want to do that more broadly, yes. May I ask one follow-up sure. question? Do you think you can characterize the uh, loss, how much efficiency you need to lose, and what level of safety yeah, I can't do that here because uh, of exactly the, uh, the, uh, the issue that I've raised, which is that here I have taken these Ws as God-given. I don't, I haven't told you and I haven't told myself, <laughs> if, if not with this Ws, how else can you produce? So to do that, I really need to endogenize the network structure. So I need to start with a parent network structure, which are the feasible sets of connections. And then from those sets of connections, I choose to connect with John and then the question would be, if instead of choosing connecting with John, if I connected with Scott or with Ariel, what are the efficiency implications and what are the volatility implications? So that's a much harder analysis. I think it's doable, but it's a much harder analysis that hasn't been done. Yes, please. Do you think the work of people at Tenji play all on the internet network uh, is a step in that direction? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so essentially, when you go, so. So, so essentially, what you have to, you know, to do that in some sense, you have to do, to, you have to merge three literatures. One is this, obviously, which is the volatility. Uh, 
The second is the network formation, because it's going to be endogenous network formation, which is the Sanjeev Goyal stuff. And then the third is games over networks, such as Rachel Cranton, Matt Jackson type of stuff, because essentially, once we kind of uh, form the network, then we're also, it's no longer competitive, because you know, I can no longer look at a competitive equilibrium. Why not? Because now I can only buy from Ariel, or at least in the short run. So we're essentially going to be playing some sort of a game. So when you merge these three literatures, then you're there. But each of these three literatures is not that easy. So then you have to find the right way of merging them. Yes, John? I want to ask an easier version of his question. Can you use this methodology to identify what are the sectors that are likely to drive the economy, or drive that's fluctuations very, in the economy? That's very easy. So to do that, in fact, if you give me the matrix, I immediately look at uh, the V vector, and the, the, the one with the highest entry in the V vector would do it. Okay, so you have the VA matrix. What does it right. tell you? So it's the, the ones that are most important are software and business consulting. Yeah, sorry? Why okay. exactly. Well, <laughs> now, the problem, crash, crash. Right. So the problem is that both of those are still aggregated. So what components of these mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, so I don't know. They're also good. information goods. I mean, certainly the IT one is, so it has naturally would scale up to the rest of the economy. It makes sense that they would be the ones that mm -hmm. have the most influence yeah. throughout. Hardest to deal with. I'm sorry. Taking the game theoretic from the point, if we were thinking again about the fourth, but then the most net outcome of the GM and the crisis of the soil and go bankrupt, but without it disrupting the player, uh, so that would have you know, very, very high utility for them. Uh, and the fact that they're not moving to different suppliers uh, maybe means that they thought that GM and Pfizer were too big to fail. Yes. Uh, do you think that's the only right. reason? Uh, not the only reason. So I think another interesting set of questions that arise, which do I have it here? Yes, I actually have that. I forgot to say that. Uh, the dynamics. So you can do dynamics here in two ways. One way is sort of pretty vanil plain vanilla, which is let's put this and put it in a linear, log linear dynamical system. Behaves exactly. So this is like the station and distribution of that. So nothing. But if you actually think of the somewhat less linear version of this in dynamics, that makes a lot of difference. So in particular, think of the following issue. You are four, and you need a couple of suppliers to survive. And suddenly, a couple of your suppliers actually go bust. So then you're in a fragile situation. Because if one more of your supplier goes bust, then you're going to have to have those stoppages and you're not going to be able to meet your customer demands and so on and so forth. So at that point, you should really start very frantically look for a new set of suppliers, which is going to take a while to build. So then the question is, should Ford have frantically started to build new supply relationships during the recession? And the problem is that you may not want to do that during a recession. Why? Because during the recession, you don't know which firms are going to su survive. So there are a bunch of issues that kind of come up from the dynamics, which might also be interesting. Sorry, I didn't understand one part. Why wouldn't they adopt the Boeing solution of buying their supply chains and bankrupt? Not that uh, that like, worked out well for them, but that kept them in business. Yeah. That, would be, that would be one solution, yes. I mean, presumably, that would be part of the efficiency cost. So if originally they thought that they shouldn't buy them, then buying them and integrate, becoming more vertically integrated wasn't their optimal strategy, and that might actually. I was thinking the scenario you, yes. you characterized, sure. the appropriate response to the firm would be to capitalize. Absolutely. It might, might be, depending on what the cost of vertical integration are. So as long as the cost of vertical integration are not very high, that would be yes. Absolutely. Yes, what about the energy sector? Yeah, I think the energy sector is much more like a financial <coughs> sector that you, you really, the thing that you really care about are zero one events, stoppage versus no stoppage. And so a ring may be very different in, a, uh, in, a, in an energy sector than. But then events like, like uh, the oil spill or uh, what happened in Japan would also have a more global influence. Right, absolutely. And, 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 and obviously there, uh, so this is the thing that I was trying to say at the end, but I went very quickly. So in the energy sector, and, and earthquakes and tsunamis, I think there really are very, very large shocks that hit the system. Now, in a, pr in a production economy, the thing might be that you don't actually have very large shocks that hit the system, but the network might turn shocks into the system. There's a different question, which I think is a very interesting one, which is what types of networks are resilient to very large shock that hit the system? And that I have an answer.